Again, part two of our most anticipated for 2023 episode. This is Keep It Fictional from the Port Moody Public Library. I'm Virginia, here with my book friends, Elle, Sadie, and Corrine. So to kick us off, last week we talked about free books, each that we are looking forward to read and dying to get our hands on. And today we're going to continue. But to start with, I'm going to um, find out from my book friends. Let's go to our existential question first. I would love to find out as you're looking for books to talk about for this um, two episodes. Did you notice that there's like specific like trends of books that are coming out that you're like, oh, there's so many of this type of book or that type of book? Or, you know, are there specific like four kind of books that you usually do I think Sadie you were talking about last week maybe a little bit of ghosts you know going back to school you know are there specific type of books that you tend to like to read more in the fall I'm gonna go to Al first all right um so for me I don't think I have a huge theme in the books that I'm looking forward to but I know that when October rolls around I always try and read nothing but horror books through October as a lead up to Halloween so uh, I'm looking forward to figuring out what horror books I'm going to read this year and just getting into that spooky spooky mood now you you do reread books right yes i do nice. i i like to reread so so are there um, like horror ones that you will reread every year or you're uh, gonna go brand new usually i go with brand new uh, rereading is kind of a comfort thing for me so um with october and with creepy reads i'm usually trying to push myself i'm usually trying to find something that will actually freak me out a bit um, so if I've already read it, I'm less likely to get spooked. Nice. Well, can you find something that creeps you out? Let me know. I would love to know. <laughs> Sadie, how about you? Yeah, so as I mentioned last week, I definitely, in the fall more than any other season, I think, try to read seasonally. And so I try to find books that just kind of encompass that whole crisp air crunchy leaves a little bit more magic I mean I read magic all year round but like that kind of atmosphere a little bit of magic a little bit of ghosts a little bit of kind of spookiness which I don't tend to read a lot of the the rest of the year um so I was looking for and I I might have to ask you Corrine for any good ones coming out I was looking for a good mystery book uh to put on my list and um I, I didn't find a ton but I'm gonna come and talk to you afterwards uh because yeah that that kind of like yeah just bit bit darker bit uh bit colder kind of books um that just really kind of encompass the season for me and uh I mean it's my favorite season and so I I, I read those kinds of books in a very comforting kind of way and they just make me love the season even more the nice weather is comforting unlike now so yes much better reading experience always miss Corrine, what is your fall reading looking like um well of course i'll have to spend a lot of time lamenting the end of good weather um and dragging out my many 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 blankets to keep me warm during that horrible awful frigid time um i think fall I, I don't tend to do a lot of reading in the summer i don't really do beach reads or anything like that because it's a really busy time of year um and so i find i don't have like the mental energy for it or you know there's there's light yeah think about that my fall lovers there's light in the evening so you can like do things and go outside um but when it gets a little bit darker i tend to go for like chonkier books and um big chunky ones i have the the end of august which is waiting on my bookshelf just like slightly above my head which i'm very excited about finishing off major 210 like i tend to go for like really chunky stuff and then the other kind of main motivator is that i am frantically trying to read a whole bunch of new releases in order to have something to choose from for my best of 2023 
three, um, because usually I feel like I'm falling behind in that I tend to kind of catch up to things two years later and be like, oh, actually, you know what? That was a good book. (laughs) Who'd have thunk? Um, And so choosing my my end of the year picks, it's always very difficult. So there's that kind of like urgency of like, you need to read at least five that came out this year that didn't suck. Um, So yeah, that's, that's my main motivator. And so Virginia, I know you are, you're always on top of it. You love the fall, but hey, pumpkin spice latte. So like, what's, what's your fall reading like? I do black coffee. Well, I mean, as people, it's funny because listening to everybody say they, they like to do creepy books. They like to do, you know, like, like kind of maybe a little bit like darker books. And I'm just kind of thinking like, but those are like books all year round for me. So I can't really pick those just for this season. As my old boss used to describe, and then Corinne knows, cold, gray, and grotesque. That is me. <laughs> and that is also described by readers, which I love. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I feel like um, for me, it would be, yeah, like definitely trying to read as many 2023 books as possible because I feel like, you know, like I'm just like, oh, but what if, what if there are some that like I haven't read yet that turns out to be much better than the five that I pick? So yeah, so I'll, I'll do be doing a lot of that. Um, I'm going to try to read, um, you know, as I pointed out last, I think a couple of episodes again, I'm going to try to read like offers that like I have forgotten and I, you know, I'm just going to put them back on my list. Um, and, and so they will be like kind of going farther back in time and try to stop myself from just looking at shiny new things. And I think I'm going to also going to try to, and I've been doing that, you know, like, and I didn't think there'll be another book friend I have to deal with, but like, I'm going to have to try more with dealing with all the, the, the Fiona and Mark books that I have like, you know, that they have talked about, um, you know, some, I'm kind of working through their list of suggestions. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. So all right. Well, um, let's talk about more books that we may or may not read by the end of the year. All right. Okay. Corinne looks convinced that, you know, like she's going to read some. So Corinne, what is the, the book that you will be reading? Yes, I commit to them. I commit again only because of shame, but I definitely do make a concerted effort to go back from the list at a certain point every year and be like, okay, these are the books you said you were going to read. And so you gotta, you gotta, unless the reviews came out and they were absolute garbage, then I'm like, well, you win some, you lose some. Um, So a book that I am definitely going to read and in fact have pre-ordered is coming out very soon. So September 5th, it seems like there's like the big days in publishing where all these books are coming out. Um, and I have seen it kind of build as the the next read after you have enjoyed before the coffee gets cold. And in fact, the premise is, I'm going to go with gently inspired, <laughs> gently inspired um, by that particular book, which if you haven't read it, I would, I, I would recommend it. It's, it's kind of lovely and heartwarming. It's about like a magical coffee shop where you go in and if you have your, your, your cup of coffee, you can like go back in time. Um, for as long as the coffee stays hot. And then after that, you're done. And so it's like a, a lovely little collection of short stories of people like realizing that they've made some horrible mistakes in their life or not and changing them or not. And so this is essentially like the same thing, but with books, um, which which I kind of love. I was really, really hoping that I would be able to talk about Welcome to the Hyun Amdong Bookshop, but it's not coming out in North America until February 2024, which I am very grouchy about. And I lament the loss of Book Depository, where I could get all of my good UK editions in advance of all the lovely books and translation that they publish that never make it to North America, um, which really bums me out. But anyways, this one I'm sure is going to be, this one is going to be fine and it's going to be lovely. Um, This book um, has a cat on it. So there's like, there's something for Sadie. Um, I have seen it all over Instagram being like um, advertised to me very aggressively. So I'm sure it will sell very well. Um, It is What You Are Looking For Is In The Library by Michiko Aoyama. Again, cute little cover, cats, books, little fern. It's an international bestseller. It's going to be very cute. And again, premise gently lifted from the other international bestseller. Essentially, it is about a very special library. 
see, Virginia is already just like trying not to laugh um, because it's very much not her thing. It's very much my thing. I love books about books. I love books about bookstores. I love books about libraries. I think it's magical. Um, and so when you come into this very special library, uh, the librarian, uh, Sayuki Komachi, asks you, what are you looking for? And this very Tokyo's most enigmatic librarian looks deep into your soul and is able to sense what each of those visitors is looking for and provide them with the right book at the right time, which I love. Um, there are a cast of different characters that make their way into this library. There is a restless retail assistant, a mother... Oh. My notes say mother overcome by a demon, but I don't think that's right. <laughs> Hold on. Mother overcome by a demotion. There we go. Very different vibe. <laughs> there you go. That's going to be my gently inspired uh, sequel to this book is that it needs more of a supernatural element. Um, so it's a mother who is overcome by an emotion. She has had her child and comes back to work and then kind of gets kind of sent down the corporate uh, ladder rungs. There is an accountant who wants to open an antique store, which sounds like a delightful tag on AO3, and a retired salary man who realizes that his life no longer has any purpose. Um, so our lovely librarian is going to search through her shelves and find the perfect book for each of them to answer all of their questions. Um, is it like unbearably heartwarming and about the healing power of books and really twee? And if I kind of like bring it and like touch Virginia with its cover, will she like burst into flames? Yeah. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with getting your heart warmed, Virginia. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong, especially in the fall when it's so cold and awful outside. Maybe you want to be warmed from the inside. So yes, uh, this is coming out September 5th. I have it pre-ordered. I'm sure it's going to be lovely. I think it is perfect for the people who love Before the Coffee Gets Cold or Days at the Murasaki Bookstore as well. If you're kind of into that whole like, what if I worked in a magical library? Um then this is for you and not for Virginia. All right. You're speaking of person. horrible, grotesque, and cold, let's go over to you. What book do you have? Mm -hmm. The whole time you're talking about like before the coffee gets cold, which of course I've never read because it is totally not my book. I was just thinking that you just, I, I'm sorry, product placement here you just have to like solve it with a yeti mug because yeti mug keeps your coffee hot forever and ever and ever which means your adventure in your magical world will never end because the coffee will stay hot sorry that's it um yeah that is so aesthetically unpleasing uh what do you mean this got uh even more aesthetically that's the worst thing you. i've ever seen Calgary that's the worst Flames receptacle of liquid i have on ever the seen yeti mug this is like Ugh. the best mug Ever. I hope you're getting anyway. paid for this product placement, Virginia. I'm not, but I don't care because I love it so much. Um, well, because you know, like, like we at work, right? Like, you know, you 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 make your coffee and then you like you work and you forget about it. And so this has saved me so much. Well, if we're doing product money. placement, let me introduce you to the BT21. Okay, so let me hold on. Uh, let me just like show your face first. Show me you show your face first. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, okay. So go, go I have it. three of these strategically placed in my room and they are electronic mug warmers. So they have three different settings. Well, one of them is just off. One of them is piping hot. The other is nicely warm and then you just put it on there and it keeps it hot for as long as you need and i have one at my desk one by my reading chair and one by my bed you don't need electricity this is it that's all you need like, yeah but mine are pretty and it has rj on it so like whatever hmm. i'm sorry like to each his own okay like yeah whatever anyway okay my book Ah, uh, yeah, that's what this show is like. Okay, um, so my book, and I don't know, because Corinne said that, weirdly, in, I don't know if it is part of the recording, but um, she said earlier that there is one book on my list, apparently, that I have, you know, like, put on my list first so that she can talk about it. And I don't know which one it is. There's only two left. I feel like it's going to be the last one, but... This one, I feel like also maybe, I oh know, maybe it's not Abiali. I don't know. Anyway, um, this is a, a translator work. I uh, also coming out in October and it is a book I pick up solely because of the title because I'm very shallow that way. 
It is also by a Shirley Jackson award-winning South Korean author. Um, but really, let's be honest, it is really mostly because of the title. Also, in the blurb that it compares this uh, to uh, works by David Lynch and also Franz Kafka. So I feel like this is like completely up my alley, which means I must, must, must pick it up. And this is The Owl Cries by Pyun Hing Yong and it's translated by Sora Kim Russell. And yes, got an owl on the cover. Um, ha In Lee is looking for his brother. The last time they talked was about six months ago. His brother called, they argued, you know, he hung up on him. That's usually how it goes because they don't really have the best relationship. His brother has always been more of a bully than a brother to him. But when he hasn't, we, they haven't heard from him, his mother got really worried. And so now Hain is looking for him really because of his mother. His brother has always been the favorite one. So Hain Lee is now at the edge of a vast forest looking for his brother because the last he heard, his brother has got a job as a forest ranger. So he figures he will go there and to seek if anyone that lives around there knows of his brother's whereabouts. The forest was once a bustling touristy kind of place. There used to be a huge, huge forestry research center there. In fact, once they have decided to establish the center, they invited people to come live around there and build like sort of a village around it. And so each person, they got a loan from the research center so that they can open a shop and lives in the place. And that's kind of how that area has grown. But now the center has relocated and people no longer come there. And so it's just a sad little village with all the people who used to live there. They call them the old timers. Now, Hain is not really sure that his brother actually works there or not. He just kind of like thinks that's where he is. And he started to doubt himself even more when none of the villagers, even the old timers, none of them have heard of his brother. The current forest ranger, who has been there for about two months, also has no knowledge of his supposedly predecessor. So maybe his brother was never there to begin with. However, Hain is a lawyer, and he's very good at asking questions. He's also very good at reading people. And something is not quite right. Something is bothering him. Every time he shows one of the old timer a photo of his brother and granted that the photo is a group photo so it's not like the best quality also like his father's his brother's face is kind of small but still like you know it's recognizable but every time when the old timer look at the photo there is a pause a very very slight pause and he noticed that there would be a certain facial expression that appears and quickly disappears from their faces so Hain thinks that they are hiding something, that they are lying to him, that they do know his brother and they do recognize him. But why? Why are they saying that they have never seen him before? The Owl Cries, this book has been described as a slow-burning noir thriller with a touch of horror and the uncanny. And I read about like a third of it now, and I can totally see the David Lynch comparisons. You really do feel like you are in one of the Lynch TV shows. It's unsettling, it's odd, everything is just kind of weird. Um, and you know that something strange, something eerie, something is threatening to show up and surface. And I sure hope that is owls. Because like I said, one third in, and there have not been any owls yet. I think there's a character at one point that has heard like a little cry of an owl, but that's it. So I hope this is not one of those like symbolic metaphorical owl books. This better have owls in it. Um, the author on one of his, uh, one of her, sorry, one of her TV interview said that like, you know, the owl cries explores a number of themes that she has always felt especially intrigued by. 
It was born out of my favorite motifs, she said, such as the inherently futile journey to fully comprehend the self, a character which does his best but always ends up with a failure and an inscrutable world wide open to interpretation. It's a book of mine that is always on my mind. So the author loves the book and I am so, so ready for this existential dread. Um, right now, the forest is closed for the season, apparently. So, you know, like we couldn't get into yet, but hopefully at the last bit of the book, we'll be able to get into the forest and find some owls. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to finishing this one up. So this is The Owl Cries by Poon Hae Young, and it is translated by Sora Kim Russell, published by RK Publishing, coming out on October 3rd, which is mostly where all my books are coming out for some reason. So anyway, all right, um, let's go to Sadie, who I think kind of doesn't mind owls, maybe? I, I, I do like owls, Virginia. I do enjoy a good owl. <laughs> Maybe not quite as much as you, but I do uh, I, I do enjoy owls. Um, I don't think my book has owls in it, though, which is also disappointing. Um, so the next book I'm going to talk about um, is, again, kind of in my wheelhouse. Um, I'm saving sort of my random one for the end. Um, so this one is definitely a bit more of a Sadie read. It's not a YA one this time, though. It is an adult book. Um, and it follows Cordelia Bone, which is quite the name. And uh, Cordelia Bone has has worked very, very hard um, to create a life for herself in Dallas. And she's kind of meticulously crafted this life that she leads, um, where she has a wonderful career. She has a wonderful husband. She has just this wonderful life. And then it kind of all falls apart. Her husband, she finds out, has been cheating on her. He leaves her. Not only does he leave her, but he leaves her with huge amounts of his criminal debt. And now Cordelia has to figure out where to go from here. An opening is kind of presented to her when her older sister, Eustace, this is a family of some interesting names. Um, so her older sister, Eustace, uh, who's a bit more carefree, she doesn't kind of craft things and plan things in the same way that Cordelia does. Um, she's actually a cannabis grower who lives in Boulder, Colorado. And she calls Cordelia to let her know that their great aunt, has just passed away. Now, they have never met this great aunt, um, but they have uh, been told that they have to come and deal with the estate. And it is in a very small town in Connecticut. And this is uh, kind of the way that Cordelia sees as her out. She's going to sell the house. She's going to inherit the money. And she's going to pay off her husband's criminal debts and figure her life out. So this book is called The Witches of Bone Hill, and it's by Ava Morgan. Um, it uh, follows these two sisters, Cordelia and Eustace. And uh, when they arrive in Connecticut and they see the house that their aunt has left them, it's an old Victorian mansion, which right there, I feel like when you see the old Victorian mansion similar to Corrine's book, you just, you know, there's, there's going to be more going on uh, than, than first meets the eye. Um, and so th what they learned about this um, is that uh, it is bound in a dynasty trust, which I'm not exactly sure what that is, um, but it's controlled by their aunt's um, attorney. And the attorney insists that they have to live in the house and they have to live in the house in order to keep they have to live in the house in order to keep the house. And they don't really know why this is. And when they start living in the house, they start to learn a lot more about their family and are even more confused as to why this attorney has forced them to live in this house. Um, they learn that there's these dark kind of rituals that their ancestors used to partake in. Um, and they're not quite sure what they are, how they relate to their aunt, how they relate to themselves. Um, there's a, a groundskeeper who you don't really know much about, but that refuses to leave the carriage house. Uh, there's the crypt, which is full of all of their dead relatives. Um, and they, they're just not quite sure what is going on. Um, so both women are living in this house and they're trying to figure out what's going on with their family and what their family is keeping a secret. 
And as they sort of discover more about their family, they learn that whatever is happening is actually tied to what happened to their mother. And they're not entirely sure what happened to their mother, but they're going to learn more about the history and more about their mother and more about a great, great evil that has been following their family for generations. Now, I would not usually go for a book that describes a twisting torrent of horror or, or of terror and blood, um, but I feel like this book does have enough other elements that I would enjoy that I'm hoping that the twisting torrent of terror and blood is maybe just like a small torrent, just like a little torrent of terror and blood. Um, and and maybe the other the other stronger mystery and relationships will kind of take over the story I might be in for a bit of a shock um so we will see um I remember putting a book on my list Ooh, this was way back in 2021 and being really excited for like the spooky atmosphere I read the first like two pages and put it down and never went back to it again because uh, it was just a bit too spooky for me <laughs> I think it was the lighthouse witches uh, maybe I'll have to revisit that one in a beautiful hot summer day one time where uh I cannot connect to the story and the scenery at all um, but yeah, so this is The Witches of Bone Hill, and I'm hoping that it's set to be kind of a, oh my gosh, there's magic in the world. We didn't know there was magic in the world. Now we're in charge of all of this magic with just a little bit of horror and mystery attached to it. No, yeah, I, I think as I'm saying this, I'm in for a bit of a shock. Yeah, yeah. That cover is like wildly dissonant with the words coming out of your mouth. It really, and maybe that's why this attracted me, because it doesn't look like a spooky book like it looks kind of like a lighthearted, like almost romance like supernatural paranormal romance kind of like bewitched style type thing <laughs> yeah so yeah that I feel like the cover is either very telling or it is completely in contrast with what the story is actually about so maybe I will have to read this one and report back and let everyone know what aspects of this book are actually accurate and what aspects are exaggerated <laughs> all right al what is your next pick before i get to the next pick i just have to say when you mentioned that the sister's name was eustace all i could think of was um the c.s lewis chronicles of narnia books but the opening line there once was a boy named eustace clarence scrub and he almost deserved it so that's that's all i could think of when i hear the name eustace but yes, um, my book, uh, unlike Sadie's, is actually more of a summer book, despite the fact that it's being published in November. Um, this is the sequel to The Tatami Galaxy um, called The Tatami Time Machine Blues by Tomihiko Morimi. Um, this book is on my list, not just because it's a sequel to a book I loved, but also because it's inspired by the plot of one of my favorite Japanese movies, Makoto Ueda's Summertime Machine Blues. Um, so in this book, during a scorching August in Kyoto, our nameless protagonist and his worst friend Ozu are glaring at each other in a four and a half tatami mat room because Ozu has just spilled coke on the air conditioner remote control. The only air conditioner in Shimogamo Yusui uh, Suiso, their famously shabby sweatbox of an apartment building. So, vengeful and despairing, our protagonist goes to his secret crush, Akashi, and is talking countermeasures when Tamura, a strange young man with a bad haircut, appears. Tamura claims to be a time traveler from 25 years in the future and shows off the time machine that he uses to travel. And of course, our protagonist has the brilliant idea to go back in time one day and retrieve the functioning air conditioner controller. However, of course, um, Ozu and several others are interested in taking a ride back in time and in attempting to alter the timeline, our protagonist also foresees the world's extinction. Even worse, Akashi mentions that she's bringing someone to the upcoming bonfire, and it's not him. So, of course, this is going to be 
As, if this is anything like the movie, it is going to be a delightfully wacky romp. We're going to have all sorts of fun time travel shenanigans. And I highly recommend this book just on the strength of the fact that it is uh, inspired by Summertime Machine Blues. If you get the chance to watch Summertime Machine Blues, it is just a delightful film. Um, highly recommend it. And I'm really excited to read this book um, as a result. Um, let's go to Virginia. All right. Um, so my last pick, I think, is the book that is probably almost, I feel like it would be a book that appealed to all three of my book friends here, I think. Um, and yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, this is the book that I picked up last time, the Owl Prize was because of the title. This one was purely because of the tagline, which is, Be Gay! Soft crimes, take naps. I don't know if there is ever a tagline that has made me want to read a book as much as this one. So I feel like this is like it deserves to be on my most anticipated episode. Um, this is The Undetectables by Courtney Smith. It is a queer fantasy cozy murder mystery with a magical serial killer, with a found family. It also features a protagonist that has a chronic fatigue syndrome, which you don't really see a lot in books. So there are so, so many things going for it. And I, I like I said, I feel like it is kind of right up everybody's alleys. I feel like some like there will be something that all of us here would enjoy. Not only does this book have the best tagline ever it also has an amazing first line also theodore wyatt's greatest regret in life was dying while wearing a cat costume so yes the undetectables is a detective agency made up of three witches mallory cornelia and diana and then joining them as Theodore, a ghost, the murder victim of their first and only case so far that they have not managed to solve yet. So Theodore is still a ghost. And as I said, he was wearing a cat costume when he died. So now he is stuck with cat ears, which he tried so many times to take off and fling it across the room, but it always keeps coming back and reappearing on his head. And a murder has happened. Another murder. A lock room mystery. Pretty gruesome one. There were symbols that are carved onto the body. The tongue of the victim seems to have got chewed off. And it definitely looks like it involved the old cults, which is not surprising because they live in a town with vampires and ghosts and fairies and trolls and witches and all the other supernatural beings. And they have agreed to live peacefully with the appearance, which is the humans. But because this murder case so clearly involved the old cults, Nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to deal with it. So the nightmare sends his human assistant, Jacob, to contact the undetectables and hire them to solve the murder. And they were very happy because it's like, finally, they got a different case. Maybe this time they will succeed in solving it. But before they could gather all the evidence, another murder happens. Could there be a magical serial killer among them so this is a like i said cozy fantasy mystery with magic which i think will check a lot of boxes for some of my book friends here um i read it i i, I feel like it, it drags on a little bit every now and then for me and i i question some of the characters behavior but i think that's probably more me than the book um you know and again you know, I mean, how can you resist a book that has this kind of tagline? So I would 
I, I would still highly recommend people to check it out. I think this will be something that many of you would enjoy um, because it is cozy, which, you know, is probably not my thing, but it is um, still pretty good. It is Undetectables um, by Courtney Smith, and it is coming out September 23rd by Titan Books. All right, we're going to go to Cozy, wait, yeah, Cozy Mystery Sadie, Sadie, Sadie. All right, I've already put that on my to-be-read list, Virginia. It's, yeah, it's definitely looking out for that one. Okay, so my final book is a bit of a distance from my, well, kind of from my usual reading. Um, It is a, a trope and a theme that I absolutely love and that we've talked about on this show, but it's uh, not one that I read a ton of books about. Uh, so this book is uh, touted as The Inheritance Games Meets Ocean's Eleven. And it is a good heist novel. Uh, so this is a YA heist mystery thriller, um, which I'm super excited about. And it is called Thieves Gambit uh, by Kavion Lewis. And uh, this book follows a 17-year-old Ross Quest. And Ross, even at 17 years old, is already a master thief. And she especially specializes in escape plans. So she's the one who helps you get out. Um, and Ross is from a very, very famous and legendary family of thieves. And in her latest escape plan, she is trying to escape her family. But things go a little bit awry when she realizes that in order to escape her family, she leaves her mother in the middle. And her mother's life starts to hang in the balance and so if ross cannot do this properly then her mother may die but all hope is not lost for ross quest because there is the thieves gambit which is a international heist competition uh, where there are a series of dangerous heists where uh, all bunch of different thieves participate all different crooks participate and killing the competition is kind of normal or at least not exactly off limits. Uh, so very, very high stakes. But the grand prize is one wish for anything in the world. And so Ross realizes that if she wins this competition, she can wish to save her mother and finally be free of her family. So when she enters this competition, she is a little bit surprised to learn that her childhood nemesis is also in this competition. Who knew that uh, thief families had childhood nemes nemeses, nemesis, nemesises? Um, and uh, she starts to realize that um, winning this competition is a little bit more complicated uh, and trickier than she imagined. So she has to realize and she has to decide if she's going to stick to her family creed, which is trust no one whose last name isn't Quest, or if she's going to have to start trusting people who she would not otherwise trust in order to get to the top of this competition and win. Well, all the while realizing that two people can't win this competition. It is only one who can win. So at the very end, she will have to decide what she's going to do. So this is going to be a really fun book. Um, the fact that it's an international competition uh, promises to take us all over the world, which is very exciting. Um, I'm hoping, I don't know, but I'm hoping that there will be kind of explanations of the heists. My favorite part of heist uh, novels and movies is when they kind of reveal everything at the end. It's like, no, 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 this is how it went. This was how it was planned. You didn't think that it was going according to plan, but surprise, it actually was. I'm hoping there's going to be some of that. Um, maybe not with all of them, but at least the the grand the grand heist, which I'm sure will be at the very end, um, will have kind of that big reveal. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of more of my my fun pick. My not seasonal or atmospheric, but just kind of a, a lot of fun, um, high stakes and fast paced and action and and things like that. Um, so yeah, I love a good heist novel. So that is the Thieves Gambit by Kavion Lewis. Kareem, have you done your last book yet? All right, Kareem, what is your last pick for us? All right, well, Virginia, you might have had the best tagline, but I think my last and number one pick has the best title. 
The last book that I want to talk about, the one that I think I'm honestly looking forward to the most, is Jewish Space Lasers, uh, The Rothschild and 200 Years of Conspiracy Theories by Mike Rothschild. No relation. So um, Mike Rothschild is also the author of The Storm is Upon Us, uh, which was an examination of QAnon, which blew my mind and not in an entirely pleasant way um but he is a uh, a journalist um he is so well researched he really brings the human element into all the stories that he tells and is able to kind of explain the unexplainable which is why he's tackling the 200 years of conspiracy theories against the Rothschild family um which arguably are kind of like they're a very famous name. I think we've kind of all heard of them. They are associated with riches, with luxury, untold money, and shadowy powers. Um, They have been accused of essentially everything. Um, I believe they're supposed to be lizard people. Um, They have manipulated wars for profit. Um, They can control the weather. I'm not sure exactly the logistics of that, but um, just all the weather. Um, and they started the Cal- <laughs> Sorry, they started the California wildfires. <laughs> oh boy, they started the California California wildfires with their orbiting solar generator. And I believe that it was Marjorie Green who said this, who is a politician in the United States. Um, yeah, so this has started all the way back in the 16th century. Uh, The family kind of started in the 16th century, where their founder, Isaac, kind of escaped from the Frankfurt ghetto to become a banker. And eventually they became one of uh, the financiers to European governments. Um, And then people started to very quickly make some wild accusations um, that financial power was essentially political power. And what can we owe all of this to? Well, I'm sure you can guess. It's anti-Semitism. It's just straight up anti-Semitism from start to finish. Um, And it's very interesting because he's tracing not only the, the histories and the roots of it, but how it's changing now. So whereas it used to be very localized in like Europe and then North America, um, the Rothschilds are apparently also manipulating everything now in Asia, um, in the Middle East, and even the world of hip hop. Who knew? Um, so this is going to be an amazing combination of research, of historical detail, and it's going to be funny because I think that what Mike Rothschild does so well is that at a certain point, you just have to sit back and go, oh boy, this is pretty wild, isn't it? But a lot of people believe it, and that's worrisome. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to this book. I think The Storm Upon Us um, was one of the best books of that year, honestly. And if you're kind of looking to kind of understand what QAnon is, um, you should definitely pick this up. And then if you're, I don't think that anyone really like wants to delve into the world of anti-Semitism, but kind of how and where that has influenced even things that you don't realize that it's influencing of why you think that certain way. I think he's going to really examine that. And he's also taking a really good look at how conspiracy theories are made and spread, which I find fascinating because lizard people is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. And I don't understand why the first person who like came up with this and then told their friend and their friend was obviously like, yeah, that, that makes total sense. They're just wearing a human skin, but inside they're lizards controlling the government. Yeah, that that tracks. Like, I want to know how. I want to know how. Um, so if you are interested in that kind of thing, uh, a fantastic exploration of uh, conspiracy theories, you should definitely pick up Mike Rothschild's Jewish Space Lasers. Again, great title, great cover. Like, look at those little menorahs just like zooming all over the place, starting apparently the California wildflowers with orbiting solar <laughs> generators. Anyhow, so that is my number one pick that I'm honestly super excited for. It's coming out uh, September 5th, so right away. So get your holds in now. 
um, or you can pre-order it. And now we are going to swing over to Al, who I believe you have not shared your number one and final pick for the fall season. Yes. So this is the only debut novel on my list. And I picked this up because the description of it was a lyrical queer sci-fi retelling of Shakespeare's Hamlet as a locked room thriller. And that just hits so many of the buttons that are for me. This is The Death I Gave Him by M. X. Liu. So this book follows Hayden Litchfield, whose life is ripped apart when he finds his father murdered in their lab and the camera logs have been erased. The killer can only have been after one thing, the Sisyphus formula that they've been working on for years and that might one day reverse death itself. Hayden wants to lure the killer out, so he hides the research, seals it, and the process uncovers a recording that his father made in the days before his death with the dying wish that Hayden will avenge him. So the lab is on lockdown and Hayden is trapped with four other people, his uncle Charles, the lab technician Gabriel Rasmussen, research intern Felicia Xia, and the head of security, Felicia's father, Paul. And one of them has to be the killer. And of course, the only ally that Hayden has is the lab's artificial intelligence, Horatio, who he has been friends with since it's been created. And Hayden has to investigate this murder, figure out who has killed his father, and push the bounds of sanity as he searches for revenge. Now, as anyone who listened to my first episode might know, I am a big fan of Hamlet, and especially retellings of Hamlet. So when I saw that this was a retelling of Hamlet that is both queer and science fiction and a locked room mystery, I was immediately hooked. This is just all of the things that I'm interested in. Um, I'm really interested to see where this book goes. I was lucky enough to get a NetGalley uh, ARC, which I am hoping to dive into soon. Um, this book comes out, I believe, November 7th. And I can't wait to dive into the world of The Death I Gave Him by MX Liu. I appreciate that they changed all of the names except Horatio. Yep, Horatio is just Horatio. Yeah. <laughs> and I like that they appear to have taken Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and just squished them into one character. I mean, they basically are. You're not wrong. That is kind of the point of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. <laughs> yeah. I'm never to contribute to this fear to talk. I would just let you both talk about it. But I do, I am looking forward to that book. I think, oh, that book sounds amazing. There's also a Sorrow uh, retelling coming out, which I'm also very excited about. It doesn't have Antonio Banderas, I assume, but it would be fine. I think. Then what's the point? I don't know. I'll find out. I don't know. It just seems, it sounds exciting. So. Anyway, um, all right. Well, those are our, oh, can I do math? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 books. <laughs> Yeah, we're looking forward to reading for the season. There are so many more, so many more. Um, and yeah, looking forward to, as you know, all my book friends pointed out, reading in a nice comfy room with a cup of coffee or tea or hot beverage of your choice um, and enjoying that reading time. Oh, can't wait, can't wait. So I hope all of you also have a great reading season. Um, and uh, yeah, put all those books on hold. Um, they are they should be all be on order at the library. So you know, like put them on hold. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing what you are looking forward to reading. Let us know. Um, and uh, we will tell you maybe in a few episodes what we think of them. <laughs> we say we're committed. I heard the word commit. Oh, earlier, I'm absolutely so. committed to all of these. Yeah, I'm gonna all do right. it. Maybe we give ourselves a year, though, just to kind of like 
spread spread it out a little bit. And there's gonna be more books that are gonna coming out, and then like that's, that's the problem, Virginia. There's end. always more books, yes. which is great. The Sisyphean task of reading books. Yes. See, what we actually have to do is set an episode where we have to read the books for and then report back. That's the only way it's going to happen. Yeah, because we have talk about it. So we're not going to talk about it again. So I guess maybe we won't read. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now that's a good idea. Let's, let's do that. Apparently in a year. Apparently. So. All right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us for our Keep It Fictional episode. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>